Hey, hey, what's up, Damascus? Lance here. And so um, if you guys have been following along with us, uh, we've been doing a couple of videos out of the nine discipline series, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, so we are in discipline number three, uh, truth, and we're going to talk about uh, Headspace today. That's the name of the video, Headspace. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's jump right in. So Damascus, nine disciplines, way of the warrior. Who are we? We are kingdom warriors encouraging men daily to become fully armored disciples of Jesus. And the become fully armored, that's the whole nine disciplines part. That's what we're we're doing here. So uh, we are in this, uh, in the nine disciplines, we are, is a system basically to help us connect with Jesus and stay connected. That's, that's what the nine disciplines is, or is for, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, each day our goal is to connect with Jesus. So we get up and we do that with, through our, our foundational disciplines, which are prayer, quiet time, and Bible study. That's disciplines number one and two. And, and through that, we connect with him and we, and we practice staying connected to him. Um, and so uh, we get this from John 15, five. It says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. So that's the whole idea. And we know that we need to go into a strict season of training if we're going to be successful at this. So let's talk a little bit about the battle of the mind, kind of where we're at. That's the tactical disciplines or tactical habits. Truth and determination is where we are. And some of those things, why are we in this battle? What is it for? Uh, if you look at the next slide here, you'll see that the battle of the mind is between light and dark and truth and lie. So that's why one of the disciplines uh, that we're talking about right now is truth, because that's the weapon we use for warfare. Uh, the battle is fought for who you are, for your purpose, your value, your soul, and ultimately your heart. This battle is won and lost in the theater of your mind. And I love this quote, which I, I like uh, from Craig Rochelle's book, Battle of the Mind. Our, eyes, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So we want to talk about that a little bit tonight. So let's jump into truth a little bit. Where This is not the full lesson. This is really primarily focusing on the headspace, like I said, that's the title. But just quickly, we can see here uh, in truth, uh, Paul writes to us in Ephesians 6. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. How? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Right? So we, Paul tells us this is the first thing he has us put on each day for this fight true. It's something we have to have with us at all times. So let's look, <coughs> excuse me, a little closer at this. Why is truth important? Important. Just a couple quick bullet points. Without truth, we're blind. We're stuck in the darkness, prisoners of what is not true. Uh, we're susceptible to being deceived. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to see through the fog of war and be sober-minded in our headspace, meaning we need to have, a, we need to have clarity and truth brings clarity. And the last bullet point, the more time you spend with truth, easier it is to spot what is not true. And truth, we know, is not just what it says in the Bible, but truth is actually a person. Jesus says, I am the truth, the life, and the way. And so let's talk a little bit about tonight's topic, which is fortifying your headspace. So we're going to talk about building uh, about where your head's at and this fortress we need to build around it and how we need to operate in here and how the enemy can easily take advantage of you if your head is not in the right place. So here we go, headspace. So uh, if you're just reading along, it says that if I'm unclear of what is true about God and his plan for me and who I am, then I'm at a disadvantage in this fight. The enemy will use doubt, misdirection to capture our headspace and this will lead us to confusion and distraction or mislead us in the battle of the mind we call this the fog of war what's coming at you from the world is foggy it's unclear what you have to kind of weed through it what's true what's not true you kind of have to as things come your way through your tv through social media through interactions with other people even through your pastor at church you have to kind of figure you know figure out what part of what i'm hearing is true. And there's this kind of this, this world of half-truths and untruths that 
are cleverly disguised. They're coming at us and we have to know how to grab hold of what's true and dismiss what's not true. And we can see this here in John when he's instructing uh, um, the early church about how to find in genuine people who are armed with truth and not false. And he says this, dear friends, so you do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You could also say, don't believe every idea thrown your way. Is this thought or idea Jesus approved. That's what you ask yourself. So just immediately what we're, we're, we're quick to jump on the things thrown away. Well, that sounds good. It must be true. And you can see this now if you just simply watch the news or you're out in the world. There's You can see the division. People are always standing on this side or that side. And, you know, they don't, it, 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 nobody knows who's right and who's wrong because there's this, this they're trying to find what's true. And so every idea that comes your way, weigh it, measure it. Is this approved by Jesus? Does this measure up to what God's values are? <coughs> that will help you. So we can see this in Colossians 2.8. It says this, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the uh, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So we got to be careful not to be, captured by these things. Another one says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, uh, be sure that you're taking every thought captive. And that's pretty intense because if you're trying to think like, well, how do I do that? Well, that's something we learn. That's why we're doing the discipline of truth. We're learning how to spend time with truth so we can spot what's not true and we can learn to quickly stop it as it enters our headspace and go, you know what? I need to stop that. I need to take that captive. I need to measure that against God's word, against his values, against his truth. I got to surrender that to Jesus so he can help me work through what it is I'm dealing with so I can decide if it's true or worth saving or worth deleting. So uh, that's kind of gives us a head start. Let's go to the next slide here. So headspace basically is we're going to talk really generally where your head is at. So what's going on in there? What's going on in your head? And every man lives basically – in one of three places. Every man is, is, his head is in the past, his head is in the present or the now, or his head's in the future or tomorrow. And we're also going to talk about these, but we're also going to talk about the power, excuse me, of if. Okay. So let's go on to the first one. Let's talk about the past for a minute. Okay. In every man's mind, the past holds only memories of experiences, things that happened to you yesterday, last week, last month, last year, etc. Okay. Experiences basically generally break down into three areas. You have joys, horrors, and missed opportunities, failures that haunt, stories that tell, and regrets to remember. So let's look at some of these in detail a little bit. Let's talk about joys for a second. So joys, that's your these are happy times, right? Joys, these are the, the stories to tell, the praise reports, and everything that went right. This is winning the championship, finding the girl, getting the job. These are heart desire moments, the happiness of yesterday. And in joy, sometimes we can go into the past and we can constantly compare where we are now to where we were then. And if you, if you know, you'll hear this a lot said going, oh, I wish. We could go back to the good old days where somebody's reminiscing about how it was a simpler time. It was easier. Their head is in the past and the joys back then, which is fine to visit and to remember, but it's not a healthy place to constantly compare where you are to then because you can't go back. You know, you are where you are. So let's go on to the next. So let's talk about the horrors, right? So horrors, that's the nightmares. Horrors are everything that went wrong. All the painful memories, abuse, abandonment, loss, the post-traumatic stresses, those post-traumatic memories, you know, the things that that cling to us. Uh, man, those sometimes these are literally the hardest thing to shake. And they, the, this is where the past may draw you back, may be constantly haunting you to pull you back into it. And it's our strain. It's our fight to, to, to move past those. But they can have... Uh, traumatic experiences could have 
profound effects on you emotionally, on you physically. Uh, they can change all things about your personality. And it's so important uh, that we get a handle on what is true when we're dealing with post-traumatic experiences. So let's talk about the next one. Uh, this one is missed opportunities, regrets. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, this is probably the biggest one for me. I, I, I often will go back and think about what I could have, should have done. You know, the missed opportunities, all the regrets, the things we wish we could go back and do different, the if onlys. Um, I'm 50 years old now, but I still, and I don't know why, will have dreams at night that I'm back on the football field in high school and I'm dropping the pass or whatever. And there's some kind of lingering thing in me from back then where I just didn't quite finish whatever it is I was trying to finish. And that regret is deeply ingrained in me. Uh, also, too, it reaches back to uh, past relationships, broken relationships, places where I failed people. And that I have that regret. You know, maybe you said something even today that you wished you could take back, but the toothpaste is kind of out of the tube. It's just, there's no way doing it. So you just have this deep regret and we can get locked up in that. We can get locked up in our failures where we maybe we made poor choices in the past. And that also too is not a place we want to dwell. So moving on, uh, there's another place in the past that we dwell or let's kind of sum up here. I like to talk, I like to talk about, I love this guy. This is uh, Uncle Rico. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie uh, Napoleon Dynamite, but there's this Uncle Rico, this character in the movie uh, who it lives in a van. Uh, he doesn't have much going for him. He, he dresses like out of date. He's, you know, dressing back like he lived in the seventies, but he's always has this thing with these footballs. I guess he, back in high school, he was kind of the, the town hero, the high school hero. He was the quarterback of the team. He was, you know, going to take him to state, but it didn't quite pan out. It didn't really go anywhere from there, but he couldn't quite let go of it. He was locked up in it. And, you know, you always see in the movie where he's getting these footballs and he's just out there just throwing the football, just trying to relive, recapture something from the past. I thought it was a good highlight. If you've never seen that movie, it's great. Uh, so let's look at scripture. What does Paul tell us? about the past. And I love this. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is head, I press on uh, towards the goal to win the prize, which God has called me heavenly for in Christ Jesus. And so if you take the context of that scripture, who's writing this, you got to remember Saul, when he started out, he, when Paul started out, he was Saul and he was persecuting Christians. He was there at the death of Stephen, you know, and I could imagine that he would go into a community and he would preach. And as he was preaching boldly, uh, there would be people there in the audience who he might have thrown in prison or done something to in the past. And he had to carry that with him. So I love how he uses this language here, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He was, it was a strain. It was a painful inward thing. And for a lot of us, we have to kind of do that. We have to, if the past is grabbing hold of you, it's causing you to be ineffective. It's taking your headspace. It's robbing your headspace, leaving you back there. You have to strain to pull yourself out of there. So what is it? The past is basically remembering and remembering is for redirecting our path. When we've gotten off track, history tells the tale of our past. So we don't make the same mistakes repeatedly. That's what it's for. The enemy always likes to rewrite the history, creating a twisted version that suits his purpose. This is part of that fog of war. And you can see that out in the world. If you just listen to the news long enough, people just have crazy ideas about what really happened in the past. And they like to rewrite it according to their own purposes. And I can see this as the language of the enemy. The enemy will show us our past failures, so we can shackle doubt and fear in our hearts in, in the now and in the future. So if, if the enemy can get you focused on the past, it can shackle you, can make you a prisoner now and or for tomorrow. So <clears throat> we have to, remembering is good. It's a wise place to visit. But now, sorry, guys, remembering is a good place to visit, but it's not somewhere we want to live. We bring out those memories 
uh, to be thankful to the Lord for what he's done. We remember all the times he's answered all our prayers, you know, but we also use our memories and failures and regrets like a scared straight program in prison. We bring them out just for a moment, just to remind us what not to do. And then we put them away. We put them back. So let's talk about the next thing. Uh, and that's the future. So uh, if your head's not in the past, it's probably in tomorrow. This is where I live most of the time. My head is always going ahead of me. I'm always thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I'm always in this planning phase. And it can really take away from what I need to be focusing on now. So let's get into this. The future. It is the giant question mark, the huge blank space ahead of us, right? We cannot comprehend a blank space in our life. So we have this deep compulsion to fill it with something. So we what if and we speculate about what's next. We imagine tomorrow. We imagine in a few minutes, next in a couple hours, next week. We're always thinking about what will happen, right? So our faith works ahead of us, but so does fear, okay? So there's two bullet points here. Faith, what it does dealing with the future is it puts the future in God's hands and develops trust with the Father, right? But on the other hand, what if and speculation, that takes it, the future back from the Father and leaves it up to human effort. It leaves it up to me, and that's not healthy. So let's go to the next slide here, the future. Here's a couple words from God's word. I have some scriptures here, James 4. I love what it says here. So just really pay attention. Uh, James 4 says this, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that. Spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And I love this. It's just kind of like, you know, it's about trusting God with tomorrow. It's not putting all your hopes and dreams of what's going to happen tomorrow, but we're going to tr- put our hopes and dreams of, in in the into who God is and what he wants to do. And what he wants to do is always going to happen today. Matthew 6 is another one. This is where a lot of people live. I know, uh, you know, at least a couple of times a week, I have a conversation with my wife where this is this is kind of where we are because we're always thinking about what's around the corner. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's powerful, man. And, and it's it just pushes us to stay away from that kind of thinking. All right, moving on. A couple bullet points to close out tomorrow. So tomorrow, it's good to plan, but do not live in your plans. If you're constantly planning, constantly planning, constantly thinking about where you're going to be, once you get there, you're moving ahead to the next place. It's not a healthy place to be. Other one, do not worry. It will not fix tomorrow and it will rob you of today. How many times we're so focused on the outcome of our circumstances that we miss out on what's happening in front of us. So trust God with what's next. That's huge. Again, let's talk about the next one. This is the hardest place to be, the present or right now. This is now. Rarely will our mind dwell here in the now. It's very, very difficult. Now is hard to nail down. We are always going back or thinking forward. It's a strain to not always be thinking about tomorrow or yesterday. So why do we do this? Why do we flip-flop? Answer, control. We want it. As long as we are in need of control, we'll struggle. We cannot change the past. We can only control, and we cannot control yesterday. We cannot change the past. We cannot control yesterday. And man, that's that's the thing. That's the where people get hung up and think about the past. I mean, if you just lay down the truth on top of it, you don't have a time machine. You can't rewrite it. You cannot put the toothpaste back in the tube and you have to find a way to let that go next we cannot see or fully know the future we do not know what's next we don't even know if we have a future we hit by a bus in a couple minutes i mean i could die of a heart attack right now who knows but we just don't know the future we have no control over tomorrow you know we just don't have any control over it and uh, lastly we only have control over our choices 
now. The only thing, the only truth that you have about control is over what you do this minute, what you do right now, how you choose to trust God, how you choose to walk, how you choose to let go of things and grab hold of things. That's the control you have right now. You can think about tomorrow. You can think about yesterday or you can live in the now. That's the only control you have is to choose which one is going to capture your headspace. So let's talk real segue real quick. As we kind of sum up, we're going to talk about this thing called the power of if. If is a mighty, mighty word and the enemy loves to use it. Yesterday, last week, last year, back then, tomorrow, next week, next month, any year, regrets, lost opportunities, tragedy, happiness, long past, and the plans, hopes, desires in unseen places, right? If only, what if, if that, if the question mark that is drawn on every road sign of tomorrow and yesterday, stress feeds on if and lies cling to it. I'll say that again. Stress feeds on if and lies cling to it. The mind swims in it constantly. Fear loves if. Uncertainty stands on it. So settle your past. Trust God with your future. Focus on the present and do not allow if to speak. So let's go into the next thing here. I'm going to give you some practical application. Let's have a takeaway, right? So Lance says, don't live in the past, don't live in the future, live in the now, right? Well, how do you do that? How, what is, what's a practical, simple way to live in the now? Well, I can tell you this on the front end. How to live in the now takes practice. I've been doing it all day. Just leave. I just left my house this morning, went for a walk, and it was virtually impossible for me to stop and just be in the moment and walk and feel the pavement under my feet and hear the birds and the sounds and enjoy the sunshine and walk. My mind was constantly moving forward to the next thing. It was difficult. It takes practice. There's a strain involved. And the only really relief I had was my conversation with God as he directs my thoughts. But I'm going to give you these steps. These are practical ways to live in the now. Okay. So to live in the now, you will need to do three things, dwell, wait, and focus. So let's talk about dwell for a minute. So Psalms 37 says this. I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. It says, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, and enjoy safe pastures. Take delight in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. So what's this passage saying to you here? What it's saying is, so you have to kind of go back and kind of understand the world as far as who was reading this Why, back when David wrote this? Who's reading this? Well, to dwell in the land back in the ancient Hebrew times, uh, that meant to build a house, dig a well, and plant some crops. It meant you were working with your hands to produce and provide. In other words, you focused on your responsibility. But at the same time, in this scripture, we can see that we, have, we can enjoy a safe workplace, safe pastures. <laughs> so what does this mean? What is a safe workplace. So we know that we have our responsibilities. We know that we're, we're, we're to, if we're going to dwell, we need to, to be active and productive and to focus on the things that are important, the things that God has entrusted us with. But also there's a second part that says that we also need to enjoy this, enjoy the things we have and take stock in it. You know, it's like, you know, stop and look at your family, enjoy them. Don't just get caught up in the rat race with them, but stop to take time. That's what I love in my house. You know, we made a commitment that at night we come together, we eat dinner, and then we turn off all of our devices, TVs, cell phones, everything from dinner time until no my son Noah goes to bed. Just kind of a couple hours of just, just focus and just kind of, you know, we can watch TV together, but it's something we're doing together. We're focusing on each other. Um, and so, but at the same time, we're doing it in this safety of this workplace, okay? So what does that mean? That means when, when, when our hearts begin to wander and fear and worry start to take over, we turn back to the one who makes us safe. If there's this, this tension between uh, taking care of our responsibilities on one hand and trusting God with the other hand, this tension, you know, where we're constantly checking in with him and taking care of responsibilities, checking in with him and taking care of just They just work in tandem. They work together. And um, we know 
that our jobs, our work, isn't the thing that makes us safe. My paycheck doesn't make me safe. My The promotion that I'm hoping I get won't make me safe. Paying off my house won't make me safe. What makes me safe is God. God's the one that makes me safe. Okay, but I take care of what's in front of me. I dwell and I trust God. So I enjoy say pastors. It goes together. So you can live in the now by surrendering all your heart to God and invest your focus in your responsibilities. Okay, invest your focus in your responsibilities. This keeps you, your mind active and keeps you in the now. Where is that? In your marriage. You're a student of your marriage. You're focused on your marriage. You care about your wife and her needs. Uh, you're also focused on your family. You're considering your family. You're thinking about your family. You're praying for your family. You're taking care of their needs. You're spending time with them. Work. You're diligent working because you know the Lord is your boss and you're, you're working really hard for whatever it is you're doing, whatever you endeavor to do, whatever career it may be, you're working hard at it. And lastly, your mission focus, man, you, you understand that you have a, that there's a greater mission, even on top of the work that you do. And that is to go out and baptize people and make disciples in the name of Jesus. So there's all these things that you can focus on that keeps you in the now. So what's the next thing? Uh, and that's waiting, man. This is the hardest part about now is waiting. That's stop, not going, not now, be still. These are all difficult things. These are hard. As soon as we stop, our minds immediately start to wander off back to the past or to the future. Why is waiting? What is, why is there waiting in the now? Why is that? I think if, if we can understand why God has us wait, maybe it would help a little bit. So let's look at a couple things here. Uh, why? We are not supposed to be driven along by our desires of our flesh it, or its insecurities and wants. Okay. So waiting a lot of times comes in conflict, conflict with the desires of your flesh because waiting says stop. Waiting says not now. Waiting says no, red light. You're not getting it. You gotta, you just gotta wait. And our flesh says, no, no, no. Our flesh is like now, 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 right? This is why like things like fasting are so hard where you like have to tell your body it can't have what it wants. Uh, another bullet point here is we're also not supposed to be driven by fear and worry. This is another thing we feel. This is back to that control thing. God puts us in a position where we're waiting. We're waiting on him to do something. And we feel like we got to jump in and do it. We got to grab bull by the horns, take control of this thing, wrestle it to the ground. Uh, again, takes us out of where we're at. Okay. And it doesn't keep us uh, in the now. It puts, us, it puts our hopes and expectations in the outcome of our circumstances. Another, the next bullet point is we're to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. And you can see this in Galatians 5. Sometimes when you're in step with the Holy Spirit, you stop, you wait, okay? And waiting at times and being still is necessary for our development, for our growth. Sometimes God wants you to wait because he's trying to develop you. He's trying to shape you. This is part of it. It's part of who we, it's part of who we're becoming. It's part of the, it's part of the crafting process of him finishing a good work in us. And note this, God's timing for us is perfect. Okay. It's perfect. And once we learn this truth, our approach each day becomes a little bit more Christ centered. Okay. We can let go of things, let go of uh, things tomorrow, let go of the past. We can kind of be in the now. Waiting in God is part of our mission. Okay. It's part of what we do. You know, he, and, and there's a good place to see this. Uh, there's a story in the Bible in John where <laughs> on the next slide where it says, you know, Jesus waits. And it's, this is and this is the most interesting scripture. You got to really spend time here and kind of look at it. So in John 11, it says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. Okay. He was in Bethany, the village of Mary and, and her sister Martha. Now, this Mary was brother of Lazarus, now lay sick, and was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped uh, his feet with her hair. Okay. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love, that's Lazarus, is sick. Okay. So that, so just stop there for a second. So here's some people that Jesus loved that he knew. He had an intimate experience with them. He was very close to them. It wasn't like they were strangers or somebody that just, you know, said, hey, come help me. There were, these are intimate relationships of Jesus. Okay. Next part. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Wow. Why did Jesus wait? 
Why did he not rush to his friend's aid? Well, he tells you in the line before that. He says, this will not, this sickness will not end in death. And what they, people couldn't comprehend at the time when Lazarus died, everyone looked at Jesus and went, well, you missed, you got that one wrong. You said it wouldn't end in death. Well, he's dead. So now what? And he goes, well, now God is glorified. Now God is glorified through me. So we can see this because there was a plan and Jesus was being led by the spirit. Okay. So Jesus waited because the spirit said, wait, God said, wait. So Jesus waited because there was, there was, there was something, there was something specific to do two days later. It wasn't going to be done today. Uh, so God's timing is perfect. And the goal was for God to be glorified. God wanted to show through his son, Jesus, the power over death. And somebody had to die for this to happen. So waiting, okay, is about trusting God with the how and the when. And that's the part about staying in the now that's the most difficult. Because we don't trust God with the how and the when. So we start going off into the what then, you know, the the, the part in uh, down the road. Okay, so let's go to uh, kind of some more scriptures on this, waiting and being still. Okay. So there, we can see all through scriptures that this is part of our shaping, part of us being transformed, okay? It's part of God's economy in us, okay? Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And again, Psalms 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know. There's, it's huge in these scriptures how important it is to understand who God is and how he does things. Because sometimes staying in the now, you may be in a waiting season, a desert season, a stop season. It may be very, very difficult for you. And you have to train your mind not to live in the outcome of your circumstances or what's next or what may happen, but you have to really lean in on Jesus. You have to really focus and be still and know God's got this. He's in control. So how do you do all this? So you focus on Jesus, okay? Philippians 4 says this, how to focus. So how do you focus? So we got this scripture kind of broke down a little bit. So how to focus, what to focus on, and add to your experience with Jesus in your knowing, okay? So let's start with how to focus. And here we can see this in Philippians 4, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything, but... In every situation, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay? So how do you focus? Well, you have to take whatever is distracting you, whatever is pulling you to the past, whatever is pulling you to the front, to the future, whatever is creating anxiousness in you, you have to go to God and you have to, in that situation, you have to get into prayer. You have to lay it out before the God. And you have to not land on the outcome of your circumstances, but you land on what is what he's done for you. You begin thanking him for what he's done for you, getting right perspective. It helps you stay in the now, staying focused on him in prayer, laying down those thoughts, those requests, those problems that you have before his feet, focused on him. So that brings to the next thing, what to focus on. So what should we if, you know, whatever circumstance we're in, where should we let our mind drift to? Where should we let our thoughts go to? How do we stay in the now? One way is to do this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, listen to that. Whatever is true, not what is not true, right? So, you know, you can't change the past. You can't go back. You can look at it all day long. So that, that there's nothing true about that. It happened, but you can't change it. So the thinking that you can change it or dwelling on it would make it go away. That's untrue. So you develop yourself, you train this discipline yourself to focus on whatever is true. That means you dismiss what's not true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if it's anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay. Uh, so if you don't want to, if you want to guard your headspace from the past and the future, you have to dwell on these things. You have to live in the now focused on these things. Another thing is how to stay focused is you add to your experience with Jesus in your knowing. And Paul says this, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. Okay, this is from experience. 
whatever the circumstances, okay, whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed, hungry, whether living with plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That's Jesus. Okay. So the focus again is from your experience. You dwell. So this is, this is an example where you go to your past and you go, you know, I remember when I didn't have much, Jesus was with me. I remember when things went great, Jesus was with me. So you don't dwell on that anymore. You bring that back to the now and you go, now I can see that I learned. So now as I go forward in the future, I know that he is with me. His strength will get me through this thing in the future. So I can dwell in the now and not in the outcome of the circumstances because he is with me. So we never take our focus of our heart off of Jesus. If we lose focus, that's when we're, we're, our, we're challenged to turn. And we saw that in the cycle of destruction. The minute your eyes come off of Jesus and go somewhere else to meet the desires of your heart, you'll be tempted and you'll be challenged to turn away from God and trust something else. And we saw that in James 1, that each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. So we have to be very, very careful not to take our eyes off of Jesus. So let's close up uh, with our conversation here on Headspace. So as we close, I just want to say this, is that, you know, we have to create a fortress, you know, a well-armed fortress. And our Headspace is super, super important. And we have to be highly active in what we let in to our headspace, okay, and where we choose to let our mind dwell, where we choose to, to set our mind and our thoughts. And we cannot set our mind on the things of the past, which we have no control over, or on the future, which we have no control over. We only have our choices now. So we put our thoughts here on the now, on Jesus, trusting him with everything. So guys, thank you so much. Man, this is Lance. Peace out.